Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Museum of Science Boston and our very special Reno Family Foundation Symposium, Women of the Web, a look at the James Webb Space Telescope. I'm James Monroe. I'm the senior producer of adult programs and theater experiences here at the museum, and tonight it's my extreme pleasure to welcome you all to this incredible conversation. I'm so thrilled to be here with a live in-person audience here in Connors Theater. Give yourselves a hand. Thank you for being here. We are also live streaming tonight's program out to an audience that's watching virtually on YouTube. So a huge hello to all of our digital friends. Thank you for tuning in wherever you are. And I'm sure most of us tonight have already been mesmerized by the incredible and groundbreaking photographs released by the James Webb Space Telescope earlier this year. Uh, and tonight we are so lucky to have with us three women of the web who are here to give us some behind the scenes insights on the project and talk a little bit about their involvement in securing those photographs, their experiences as women in the industry, the importance of global science collaboration, and so much more. And I'm so thankful that all four of our very special guests have made the trip up to Boston and are here tonight to share about this incredible and historic work on our stage. And tonight is a part of our current fall season of adult programming. It's actually the last program, uh, a part of our fall lineup. So um, I encourage you to check out our website at mos.org slash adults. And you can sign up for our mailing list because we are about to announce our winter spring 2023 lineup. And you won't want to miss that. Now, in a few moments, our panel will take the stage for this conversation. As a part of that, they'll take questions from all of you. So if you have a question, whether you're at home or here with us in the theater, you can pull out your smartphones and go to slido.com and enter the code JWST, just as it appears on the screen behind me and on your screens at home. Once again, that's slido, S-L-I-D-O.com, and enter the code JWST, and they'll get through a bunch of those questions a little bit later on. And now I need to start tonight off by thanking Jack and Susie Reno for their ongoing support of the adult programming here at the museum, specifically through this symposium series. Yes, uh, it is one of our favorite programs every season to produce, and through their support, we've been able to welcome incredible speakers like Jonathan Van Ness, Taraji P. Henson, Professor Ibram X. Kendi, and tonight, the Women of the Web. Um, so please join me again. Let's have another round of applause and thanks to Jack and Susie Reno and everyone at the Reno Family Foundation. We couldn't do this work without you. But now it's my extreme pleasure to welcome out to the stage our panel tonight. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Begonia Vila, Dr. Stephanie Milam, Dr. Heidi B. Hamill, and our moderator tonight, senior correspondent at Radio Lab, Molly Webster. Enjoy. Hello, hello. Um, hello, hello. How is Hi. everyone? <laughs> Great. Uh, so I'm going to make this quick. I'll just say I'm very, very excited to be here. These are scientists and women that I admire so much. I've been watching JWST from afar through like different science reporting for years. It's been through the, <laughs> it's had many iterations. And so it's very, very cool to be here. Um, we're going to do tonight by the, the images basically, um, and using the images to sort of dig into all the various areas of research we have on the stage, how these folks collaborate with each other, just who they are. Um, and so I just want to start uh, with this image, because I think one of the really exciting things that has happened, at least that I've been noticing, and I'd be curious how the, how the audience feels and how you guys feel, is um, when this photo came out, I feel like it just like arrested the world. Like it felt like such a beacon of just joy and relief and happiness. Um, and I'm just, audience, like, give me, have you seen this before? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and it, did it feel like, uh, were you all like, oh, thank God, is the pandemic maybe over? <laughs> like, it was like, it was just like, <sighs> and I feel like it's like re engaged people with science in a joyous way that I just haven't seen since I, or felt in a really long time. And so you're all nodding. Um, so maybe we can just, just to hear from you all at once, go down the line and talk to me about like what this photo, what this photo did for you or like how it, you know, how you felt it. So Heidi. So when I saw this picture, there, there's a combination of just sheer beauty and just go, oh, that is so beautiful. But it's also the fact that it's it kind of reminiscent of something human. It's, 
cosmic cliffs with the sky in the background and the, the dust in the foreground. So it's sort of a combination of hardcore astrophysics, but it's accessible too. Mm -hmm. And uh, just, just, you know, when I show this, I like to explain what it is uh -huh. so that people can go just a little bit deeper. Uh -huh. I don't know how far you want to go. We might want to hear from our other people too. Um, give, give, me, give me 30 seconds on what it is. 30 seconds. <laughs> if, you, if you notice up at the top, there's like some spikes. There's some really bright newborn stars up above this picture that you can't see. Uh -huh. And those newborn stars are blowing out really strong winds into the dust cloud from which they formed. And that cliff there is the edge of the dust cloud. So you're seeing sort of a piece of a giant bubble that's being blown out by those really bright stars up above that you can't even see. So, so is it like is is the is the the red frothiness the dust from which they were born? In, in fact, it's the dust in which new stars are being born right at this moment. You can see there's some little things that stand up a little bit. They kind of poke up. At the tips of those are newborn embedded stars, and they're denser than the surrounding dust. That's why they haven't been pushed down like their surroundings. And so if, if I were giving this as a public lecture, we'd zoom in on there, uh -huh. and we'd like zoom in on places where you can actually see some of those stars busting out of their, their natal dust, dusty cocoons. It's all in there. It's, it's like the formation of stars. In addition to being incredibly beautiful just to oh look at. Oh my God, at. I just want to go swim in it. That's amazing, <laughs> Steph. So um, I'm one of the fortunate few that got to see all of the images before everybody else. Okay. And um, when this one came across my desk to review, because I have to make sure that everything is NASA-fied, um, this one came across my desk. It was, I think, the second one that I saw. And I opened it up and I cried. It was emotional for me, uh, the sheer beauty alone. But, oh my gosh, there's so much science in this one image. <laughs> and it was the second image that I saw from JWST. So to me, it was just this all of a sudden overwhelming sense of we are, we're rewriting the textbooks and we just got our first glimpse. Um, Can you tell me a, a rewriting that you're seeing here? So we have no idea how... The dynamic, as Heidi was saying, of these bright new stars are kind of eating away the material that the baby stars are trying to be born of. So there's a balance between the new stars that have just formed and those that are trying to form. Oh, so, there, so the so the the newly born are going in and like eating the material that would help grow the new. Yeah, yeah. That's very carnivorous. Yeah. Okay. So it's they call these stellar nurseries. Um, just because I'm we're like thinking of spiders, like don't isn't there something <laughs> where like this, the, you're, you're born, you have to get out because like you're, the mom will come eat you or the dad will. Okay. <laughs> this case yeah. is your brothers and sisters. This is your okay. brothers and sisters. Yeah, that feels right. Uh, that feels. I have siblings. That feels right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Love you guys. So yeah, it's and we don't know how big stars are formed compared to yeah. small stars, and all of that information is just captured in this one glimpse that we have, and we'll see some other ones um, yeah. as well, but. Yeah, this this wasn't a very emotional picture for me. What the, what, what's the distances we're looking at here? The question is, what is the distances we're looking at here? We're really, really big. <laughs> <laughs> well, think about it. Each one of those stars, if our solar system was around one of those stars, you wouldn't be able to see our solar system. So this is much, much larger scales than we think of, you know, locally. Just one of the stars. Yeah, just yeah. any one of the stars. You would not be able to see our solar no. system. No. Gosh, I wish I had you guys on hand every day to go through these <laughs> images. But we, I'm, we're gonna. This is great. What do you, what do you see when you look uh, at that? Both the same. Yeah. I mean, it was a beautiful image. Uh, we had to spend the six months. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about that to making the telescope ready. Oh, and yeah. we already could see how wonderful it was going to be. And then this, as uh, Heidi and Stephanie are saying, is a beautiful picture, but also so much science. Right? Those stars being born, pushing the dust away, but then other stars trying to be born. Uh, some of them are probably not burning hydrogen yet. You know, they are yeah. not shining, but they will shine. Uh, some of them might be having planets forming around it. So lots of science there just on this single image uh, and showing beautifully 
like the other first images that were released, the capabilities of these awesome telescopes. So I think we were all... Uh, and is this just real. like a, a minuscule place out in the universe oh, somewhere? Yeah, yeah. Yes, this is just a tiny piece a of tiny a much, piece. much bigger mm -hmm. nebula. And the first images, the other um, thing on web is that it's very powerful. Those first images that were released, uh, we kept saying, you know, we took them before breakfast. You know, they were not long integrations like some of the ones we are doing now where it's hours. These first ones were not very long, and we were already seeing this wonderful thing. So we're, it's we're gonna certainly a powerful We're going to get into, as Begonia said, telescope. just in a way how they take the, the images. Mm -hmm. That's very, so this is like a quick, this is like a, this is <laughs> yeah. like a Polaroid? Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> on different wavelengths, but just a few hours. So my question is uh, the colors. Is this actually colors in space, or is this our interpretation of like what colors in space look like? So yeah, so this is, these are not real colors. Okay. I mean, they look real and they're beautiful, but this telescope is an infrared telescope. So it's designed to look at wavelengths of light that are longer than our eyes can see. Okay. And so to make a picture like this, that has the blue and the, the brown and the reddish and maroonish hues, what they do is they take different black and white images taken at three or more different infrared colors, and they assign them to different color channels that our eyes are sensitive to. Mm -hmm. So you okay. might put one wavelength in a blue filter, another one in a green filter, another one in a red filter, and put them together to create this color composite. Mm. And so like one, people ask, well, that's not real. And I was, I was just thinking, we were, we were chatting about this because I, I, I broke a toe in my foot, right? And I had an x-ray done, and I'm showing people on the screen my x-ray. Do you say, that's not real? Well, it is real. <laughs> it's an x-ray picture of my foot, but it's, it's, it's turned into wavelengths yeah. that our eyes can see. Yeah. And so the same thing is happening with our James Webb Space Telescope images. Mm -hmm. We're taking wavelengths that we, our eyes can't see and converting them through this process into wavelengths that we can see. Mm. And it's a very complex mm -hmm. choice. I, I don't know, Begonia, yeah, if you have some yeah, insight into that. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's very about difficult. I mean, I think Heidi explained it very well, right? We can see red, blue, green, right? And on this visible, which is how our eyes look. Now we are on the infrared. So mm -hmm. this theme that is an awesome theme is trying to kind of shift those colors over here so they make sense to us. And it's, it's a difficult process to uh, calibrate the images and then to assign those colors so they are realistic and how to make the contrast so, mm -hmm. so it looks good. So it's an awesome team at the uh, space. I will say um, that, that mosquitoes can see infrared, mm -hmm. right? Some insects can see infrared. So if they were out there, it might look like that to them. <laughs> or even more. Maybe. Don't they have crazy eyes? Like yeah. it could be even more crazy. Maybe. Okay. Um, <laughs> Moving Steph, right anything on. to add? No, they've covered that. Well, okay, I will ask you, when this one first came across your desk, you said you had the inside peak. Uh, was it, I'm assuming it wasn't in this poppy color. It was. It was. Or was, it was. You yeah. saw this image. Yeah, okay. I saw this version. Um, and, uh, yeah, again, I just, it was emotional. Yeah. And don't make me look at it anymore. I'm gonna okay, well, that's great, because we're going to go to, to more. Don't cry. This is perfect. Okay, so... Um, I want to, I asked all of the folks up here to give me some of their favorite images that had come in, uh, and I thought it'd be a good way to like dig into, uh, the work that they do. So Steph, we will start with you. Um, tell us, you said this just happened this week. Did I get this right? This, yeah. Or we like just released it, came, it a just couple released, days ago. But it probably <laughs> happened, I don't know, millennia ago. I don't really know. <laughs> um, so can you tell us what we're looking at here? Absolutely. So what we're seeing is a new star that's forming, and it has a, a disk of material. So it's starting to form its own planetary system around that star. Now, what's deceiving in this image is you don't actually see the star itself. It's the tiny sort of center of the hourglass, and there's a little black or dark streak that goes across the center of that mm. hourglass. And that is actually the dust and what would be 
eventually a planetary system forming okay. around that, that star. So the, the, the darkness is actually the star. It's actually it's the, the opposite tiny, of what yep, we would it's, think. It's that, just not the maybe edge like, darkness, yeah, but the yeah. very, very, that yeah, in the, the middle. waste, right. Okay. So that's the actual planetary system mm -hmm. that's forming and the star that's forming. But what you're seeing now is as the star is forming and all this material is collapsing, um, it's pulling all that gas and dust into itself. And so that's where you're seeing a lot of the darkness, but then it's also ejecting a lot of radiation because it's so energetic of you know condensing all this matter that it has to get rid of some of that energy so it blasts out a lot of yeah. light and that light is lighting up all of the gas and dust in the surrounding area that it's heating so um, you're seeing sort of these beautiful striations through those big, what looks like an hourglass um, coming out. And that's where the star is just episodically losing mass and material and blasting out energy as it's starting to form its planetary system. This is absolutely a fantastic image. And um, I'm glad we talked about the different wavelengths and the colors. And so I very carefully made sure that I included that information on these so that you can get a sense that, so this is oh, four different right. wavelengths of light that we used to make this image. And they used colors to represent those different wavelengths, even though they're not the colors that we would see with our eyes. And, and it's interesting because I feel like in these conversations, there's, we talk about stars a lot. Is, is, uh, Honestly, like, what does it mean to be a star in this, in this moment, and what is it going to do? So this is a really, really, really early phase of, okay. of a star. Okay. So it's just starting to burn hydrogen, mm -hmm. um, just starting to have its own nuclear fusion going on. So um, the way a star shines is by putting atoms together and making them bigger atoms and bigger atoms. Okay. And so this is what we call burning. Um, and what it's doing is, is, is nuclear fusion. So um, what you're seeing is the very, very beginning stages of that. It's starting to get so massive and so much material and so much energy that it's starting now to burn hydrogen. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes it a star, and that's what makes stars shine. Mm -hmm. And can you connect this? I mean, you study bo bo like bodies in a solar system, right? You study, like, kind of, you, you described it as, like, the crumbs of the universe. So <laughs> where does that part of you walk into this image? Uh, that's, that's a great question. So um, my science is actually studying small bodies in our solar system, so asteroids and comets. And these are the cookie crumbs from when the planets were actually made. Um, and they tell us a lot about how the planets formed and how our solar system has evolved. So what we're seeing is that dust that makes that sort of waste across the hourglass, that's all the dust that's going to eventually form planets, but some of the dust is actually gonna be preserved in things like asteroids or comets. Oh. And so I can now observe these objects and see what the chemistry of this object looks like compared to the chemistry of our own crumbs mm -hmm. and understand how things have evolved and what was really there, what was the kind of material that actually made our planets. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the most intriguing things, and this is a perfect example of that. And, and if you see an image like this, because like, I'm guessing with like something like JWST, it's letting us see things like we haven't seen before, right? So if you see this and you're like, oh, this is the, the sort of very beginning of this, uh, this star, this planetary system potentially, the, it, and these crumbs, are you able to like track those crumbs like can you can you can you see can you follow them like now you know because I feel like we've maybe never been able to see this before so we just get the crumbs after they like get to us you know <laughs> but like this is like the the baker's crumbs right at the beginning on the kitchen yep. counter yep and that's that's something we're trying to do okay. we're trying to actually study what the composition of that is and see if all planets start with the same ingredients. Right. Are we are we constantly making chocolate chip cookies or, or other planetary systems? You know, <laughs> pumpkin cookies or whatever. We whatever don't we don't want those. Yeah. Those are, I'm <laughs> gonna stick with the chocolate chip cookie system. And so we're trying to look at those ingredients, and that okay. tells us a lot about how planets are formed and what's going on, what kind of planets they're going to have. Mm -hmm. um, so if you start throwing nuts into the mix, are you going to have you know more terrestrial planets? Are you going to have more gas okay. giants? Those are the kinds of things we really want to understand, and it tells us a lot about not only how our own solar system formed, but how all these other planets now that we're studying around other stars, how they formed and what it means about their evolution right. as well. Right, and I should say that what I heard was that 
some very big news came across Stephanie's desk today, but she's not allowed to tell us about it. No. That's all I'm allowed to say. <laughs> but I just felt like we should get that out so you know you're in the presence of greatness and <laughs> something big is happening. <laughs> Um, yeah. Heidi, you're nodding a lot, please. Yeah, because we were texting each other all day <laughs> today. There was a lot of exclamation marks in our text okay. and wows and woes. And do we woo. do we know when the world might know about what comes the words that come before those exclamation points? Mm, a few months, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Maybe sooner if we can. Yeah, maybe good sigh. Sooner. Yeah, make them feel it. bad. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Okay, um, Heidi, you were nodding uh, excitedly. And so I want to move to something of yours. You can sort of tell me the best moment to do the next sure. one, which is that. Yeah. The, um, yeah. But uh, why don't we, If also feel free to jump in if you guys are like, oh, Stephanie said something and I want to jump on that. Sure. But this is one of your favorites. So. Yeah, it is. And um, just a little background. Um, yeah. The reason this was one of my favorites is I started working on this project more than 25 years ago. And I joined it because I had been working on the Voyager project when oh. we did the Neptune flyby. Wow. And I just loved working on that project, but there were no missions to Neptune. And so <laughs> I said, well, what's the next best thing? The next generation space telescope. That's what I'll use uh -huh. to study Neptune. And that's what it was called originally, right? Next Let's generation yeah. okay, space yeah. telescope, yeah. right. And um, <laughs> so, I was waiting 25 years for this picture. <laughs> and right, if you look in there, it's a beautiful deep field taken with JWST. But in the middle of that field, you could see there's a, a what looks like a bright blue star. And then down below it, you see something that almost kind of looks a little bit like Saturn, right? Um, but if you zoom in on that, mm -hmm. um, oh, do your next time step, <laughs> that's <laughs> Neptune. And that is so great. 25 <laughs> years waiting for this one picture. Oh. Um, and um, this was actually not a science picture that my team chose. This was a public press image, just four exposures, four different wavelengths that were put together here. And remember, it's infrared wavelengths because people say, why isn't Neptune blue? I thought Neptune was blue. Well, it's not. <laughs> Who are those people? Yeah, <laughs> I, it's, but this they is infrared. And so it's not yeah. blue in the infrared. And the beautiful ring system, it just that's pops. And people are like, I didn't even know Neptune had rings. Well, that's because the last time we saw them like this was in 1989. And there's some young people I can see here in the audience, they weren't even born then, right? <laughs> so I don't blame them for, not, for missing that. Um, but <laughs> here the rings just popped right out of the image. And the reason they pop like this is that infrared wavelengths, Neptune's atmosphere has just a little bit of methane, mm -hmm. but methane is a super strong absorber of infrared light. And so the planet actually is really dark at this wavelength. That's another reason it's kind of kind of murky and misty. Mm. Um, that's scattered light, but it's the planet's dark, so the rings jump right out. And they're beautiful. And there's moons. You see I was like, are those you, moons? Those like, are moons I, embedded in the yeah. rings that you can see and other little moons around it. And you see the atmosphere, I mean, it's just filled with clouds. And we kind of knew that. Um, but uh, the rings, when I saw this picture, like Stephanie, <laughs> I started to cry. I'm like, oh, <laughs> 25 years waiting. And then I got really happy and I started mm -hmm. jumping up and down. It was in my office at home. But it was like in your basement. In my basement. This is what I keep imagining yeah. is yeah, I'm in the basement. Solo in a basement in the <laughs> middle of a pandemic. I got a computer pandemic. screen there and yeah. this, this image is on the screen. I'm jumping up and down and crying at the same time. And I'm, <laughs> kids, kids, come look. Mom, come look. I took my cat. I held my cat up to the screen. <laughs> look, look, it's this picture of Neptune. It was just, I mean, that's uh, that kind of joy is being repeated with different astronomers and different mm. J JWST images, depending mm. on what their love is and mm -hmm. what their science focus is. For me, it was it was this image that just blew me away. And can you go backwards yeah. once? I just wanted to make one point. That blue star yeah. that you see, yeah. that's no star. That is Neptune's moon Triton. And the reason it looks so bright compared to Neptune is that Neptune is dark at these wavelengths. It's, oh. The light is absorbed by the methane in its atmosphere, but Triton is super reflective. 
it's one of the most reflective surfaces in the solar system. Mm. And it's, it reflects like 98% of the light, the sunlight that hits it. So in this particular picture, it's just booming bright. Mm. And so when we get to the point where we're studying Triton uh, with JWST, we're going to be... It, it, it's too far away to really resolve it. You won't get Voyager quality pictures of Triton, mm -hmm. but that light, there's so much of it that we'll be able to spread it out into its constituents and measure the chemistry and the surface and the atmosphere of Triton. And so it's just, just wanted to mention that because people are like, what's that bright star there? I'm like, oh, that's Triton. Did you I think even when you started this 25 years ago, that you'd see something like this? Well, you I know. I mean, like technology, I mean, also if I think about the technology yeah. change, yeah. even if you were working on the next great telescope, did you think it was gonna give you that? I'll tell you, we, we were always working to what we thought was <laughs> the best that we could do. Mm -hmm. And the engineers who designed this exceeded our expectations. Mm -hmm. Every quality, the, the sharpness of the image, the amount of light through the system, everything about it, how well it felt, it's all just a little bit better than we had expected. And so, you know, I kind of knew we'd, I mean, the reason I worked on this for 25 years is I knew I'd be able to do great science, but I just didn't expect it to be that amazing uh -huh. and to see the rings with that sharpness and clarity. It's There's gonna be science like that we, hadn't anticipated. And like I said, these aren't even our science data yet. We have It's like probing, funny, I don't even so. know what that means. I'm like, this is a science data that gets to me. <laughs> well, like, we, when we design our program, we actually are looking at the specific wavelengths of light. Mm -hmm. So we're carefully choosing exactly which filters mm -hmm. we use to, for example, maximize the, dis the differences between those different clouds. We know that they're different altitudes. And by being very clever about what wavelengths of light we choose, we can actually build up a three-dimensional model of the cloud structure. These, these images weren't tuned that way. They mm -hmm. were just, you know, let's make a pretty picture. Um, so uh, <laughs> we, we, we are, have a program that we very carefully selected the wavelengths. Yeah. Um, and we're also planning to do what we call spectroscopy. All right, we got to say this. A picture is worth a thousand wor words. A spectrum is worth a thousand pictures to an astronomer. Mm. So we take that light and we spread it out in the rainbow of colors. And by looking at what colors of light are missing or added, mm -hmm. that tells us the detailed science wow. in that picture. So you will see a lot of what we call spectra. I don't know if we have any in this. We, we, we have do one. have one coming yeah, up. Good. But that's, that's, that's huge for us is the spectroscopy. Mm -hmm. So that, that, we don't have any of that yet, but it'll okay. come. It'll come. Well, this is a perfect segue to <laughs> the engineer. I feel like we should give Begonia a round of applause because <laughs> these photos like, are coming from you. Um, and your team, obviously, I know that. Um, okay, so I love this as one of your favorites because we're actually going to see the way JWST like deploys and then kind of get into how you make images from it, like all these images that we're watching. So right. do you, is there, before I hit play? Yes, so, <laughs> so yeah, though my background is in astronomy as well. I ended up now as a systems engineer on web. And it has been a work of thousands of people. And I think it, it was, it's awesome as far as the science as we are going to see, but it was also an engineering achievement, right? When you launch something into space, you're always limited by the size of the rocket. And this was the biggest telescope we have launched that we folded up uh, to open it once we were in space. And um, this was very difficult to test, very difficult to make sure everything will work as it would. And what you're going to see now is a video showing you uh, the first 30 days after we launched all the different components that had to be opened up. Uh, so if you play, then I'll, I'll tell you. Um, okay. So this is super speeded up. Right? This is super speeded up. This is so not 30 days. Right, not it's not 30, 30 days, yeah. it's just <laughs> faster. And it's, it's going to show you, yes, we are not keeping you here. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so no, I bet you some people in the audience would stay. Would stay. <laughs> okay, you ready? So we knew, okay. yes. So yeah. if you start, so one of the first things we knew um, 30 minutes after we launched that we had to open the solar array. So we had a battery, but that wouldn't last for very long, only a few hours. So you can see the solar mm -hmm. array coming up. That If you see the video of the launch, 
you can see the video lasts those first 30 minutes and you can see it opening up. Then you saw the antenna to be able to communicate. And then we have a sun shield, right? Um, and this is because this telescope is infrared. You can think about the infrared as heat. Everything emits heat, we all emit heat. So you're looking for this signal from these faint objects. You have to cool everything else down, otherwise they are going to swamp that, that heat as there is going to swamp the signal. So we need to use this sun shield, it's kind of like a beach umbrella, <laughs> which if, it's, if it was here, it's as big as a tennis court, but you saw how really? folded up we had to have it. And then it has to open up, it opens like this to its full size, it has five layers. Uh, and that part is always going to be looking at the sun and the earth, and that's to keep the telescope and the mirrors uh, and the instruments in the cool side so they can mm -hmm. get cold to almost absolute zero. They, they are at minus 387 Fahrenheit to be able to do the science. They have to be that really? cold, so then any signal that you pick up comes from these wonderful objects. So we had all this process where uh, you saw the mirror, uh, we want to detect very faint things, so you want a bigger mirror, but the mirror wouldn't fit inside the rocket, so it was made of 18 smaller mirrors that we could fold, but then we had to align once they were uh, on orbit. So a lot of work to be able to achieve uh, the amazing performance <laughs> that we needed to get the science that we are seeing. And there were lots of what we call single point failures, things that could have gone wrong on those first 30 days that a few of them would have caused a loss of the mission. So for us, on the, on the mission operations center in Baltimore, it was like uh, a nervous day, and whoa, that work, and then <laughs> the next day, whoa. So it was a set of uh, multiple exciting times uh, for that first 30 days. Were you able to sleep? We had shifts, yeah. <laughs> so we I, had to face yourself. Even just emotionally, yourselves. even oh, if I was yes, off shift. It, it was. We, you know, we had moments. Everything went wonderfully, so we were very pleased. But uh, you know, it was it was a hard time, and and this was just the first first month. Uh, we still had another five months to go, so it was a large team uh, that included all of us in different shifts, mm -hmm. making sure that the different parts were good. So. It's so like watching. Have we ever had an unfolding? No. So this yeah. uh, this is the first time we are doing it, and now it has opened the opportunity for future telescopes that if they need a big mirror because they want to collect more light or mm. they need other structures, we know we can do it. We have the technology, so it's always good to to have this. So we, we had a set of engineers that were like, well, providing we deploy, we are great. And then the scientists that were like, no, 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 we also have to oh, turn yeah. the instruments <laughs> on. You know, everybody wanted to. Uh, it had lots of um, incredible things in many uh, sectors or only many parts of the observatory. So I, I wanted just to show it so people yeah. appreciate uh, how the telescope looks like. If we could see it uh, in a space, it looks like that. Uh, with, again, the sun shield always going around the sun like the Earth, always yeah. keeping the Earth and the sun. So we are doing circles like this to keep uh, the mirrors and the instruments on the other side always cold. It's, so. it's very, um, like, animalistic in its yeah. unfolding. You feel like, oh, my like gosh, I'm watching this thing come into being. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. How do you go um, from being a... Uh, being an astrophysicist to an engineer. Is that, is that what is that? Uh, yeah, I think it's a transition how life takes you. So I, I do have a PhD in astronomy and I worked in the university in, in the UK for um, quite a few years doing research. And then um, something that may, I think it's still true, but and, uh, maybe Stephanie and Heidi can comment. Normally you get a postdoctoral position, which is three years, and then you have to look for another one, which mm -hmm. implies often perhaps to move to another university and at some point in your life you're trying to establish a family in my case so you can't be just uh, moving. So I decided to transition to the private sector uh, which has been a wonderful experience uh, building telescopes to go into space and you can contribute the science, you know, you can do all the analysis to show it's going to meet the throughput is going to do the performance, so it's it's kind of nice to, mm -hmm. uh, in my case, to, to do uh, mm -hmm. to have both both sides. Yeah. yeah, and Steph, how much are you interacting with the sort of engineering and the this part of the project in the work that you do? So I'm 
perfectly sitting right in the middle of my scientists and my engineers, um, and that is my role. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a, a liaison between the two. So um, my job actually on the project was to make sure we could observe objects in our solar system so that we could collect Heidi's beautiful images. Um, but that also meant that we had challenges with the telescope because it's this big floppy <laughs> boat looking thing in space <laughs> that's you know, hunting for the first galaxies of the universe. And I want to point it at Mars yeah. or an <laughs> asteroid, right? And um, asteroids move really, really fast. So we have to make the telescope move really, really fast. And that took a lot of work with Begonia and her team um, specifically on how to do that, how to make the telescope actually be able to track an asteroid flying across the sky or it didn't watch it move that fast. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. We we're, we're I mean fast. <laughs> I thought yeah, it was kind of like lock I mean, in ding, like <laughs> watch but it, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean it's it's very interesting to observe solar system versus Better away, right? I am the lead for the guidance sensor, which is one of the instruments that won't show any images because it's always on the background, but it keeps the observatory stable, pointing to, to one location. Okay. If you're looking at something that's very far away, like uh, galaxies, a we Neptune. choose not no, Neptune, no, 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 solar not system. Not even, okay. Right. Yeah. So we have to do it differently. When you're looking at something very far away, we can choose a star and we just have to keep the observatory steady so the images and the spectra don't move, and, and that's one way of doing it. When we are looking at the solar system, it's different. The objects on the solar system are moving. Mm -hmm. So if we kept the telescope pointing to a single star, the science will show Neptune going, which is not <laughs> what they want. So what we need to do in this case is we have to find the star and load an algorithm that moves the same way as Neptune or the asteroid or whatever moves. And what we do is we make that star move mm. that way, which in effect, so we move the telescope so Neptune or the asteroid mm -hmm. or whatever stays fixed. Yeah. So it's two different ways of handling uh, the data that's needed, right? Okay. So but can I give you some, background. some background? That, like, mm -hmm. what, we, what were we doing for 25 years? <laughs> um, that's right, yeah. sleeping so on the job, when, I'm when sure. We, when we started, when I officially became an interdisciplinary scientist for JWST, in 2002, that was official, I had mm -hmm. been working on it for five years before that unofficially, uh, <laughs> moving target tracking was part of our level one requirement. Yes. And a level one requirement for NASA means you must do this mm -hmm. for mission success. But about a few years in, we got a revised level one document. And of course, you know, I've opened it, read it, checked it. Moving target tracking was gone. It's just deemed no longer important to the mission. And I kind of understood, right, because this telescope truly was designed to see the most distant galaxies that ever formed in the universe, and you don't need moving target tracking for that. Mm. At the same time, I knew <coughs> that this telescope would be able to do fantastic solar system science. That's why I proposed to be a scientist for the program. And it was close to seven years of work, mm. lobbying, and um, uh, you know, uh, here, here's one of, maybe you don't know this, uh, Begonia, but at one point where they said, we can't do moving target tracking. And I said, okay, but are you gonna do dithering? Mm -hmm. Dithering is where you're, you're looking at a star and to take a picture of a galaxy, but you move the star around so that you get the, the, the galaxy on different parts of the detector. And they said, well, of course we'll do dithering. <laughs> I'm like, okay, what about if we do a linear dither pattern? <laughs> and they're like, well, I, yeah, we can do that. I'm like, that's moving target tracking. <laughs> and so, I mean, it was a lot of, like, that's sort of the creative thinking part of being a scientist, yeah. working with the engineers mm -hmm. on how can we do this, actually implement it, you know, without um, having to invent a whole new system. I knew that they were going to be doing. Do you remember this part? No. No, it, was pre it predated your time yeah. as well. Yeah. So this was, you know. Because this is your 25 years, you're 10, yeah. you're 16. Mm -hmm. the, this is, we've got a lot of history here on this. <laughs> That's so great. It's so great. Okay, so I'm going to move us to just, we were talking about how 
um, we actually make these images that we all are getting to see. And so we'll get we'll get into this now. So yes, yeah, so Begonia. after and you tell everything, me when to go to the next one. Yes, too. everything was deployed, so we're all super happy. So now we are ready. The instruments cool down. That sun shield is doing its job. So everything cools down, and we can turn the instruments on and take an image. But now. Remember, we said we had 18 mirrors. We are going to take an image. And the one that you see there, we choose an, a star that's completely isolated. There is not many stars around. Why? So this is one star. That's one star, because each of the mirrors behaves as its own mirror. So instead of oh. getting a single star, we get 18. So that's why we don't want too many stars, because everything will be duplicated by 18. So the, the, the next phase of this process was I find those 18 dots that we know are the same star and plot them to which mirror they belong. And you can see the image there where they have been identified. If you remember the 18 mirrors, they look like that. So yeah, we it know looks like that exactly shape, the how that shape. Sun shape. And the way we have done it is if you move one mirror, you see which of the stars move. So you know that's that mirror. Mm. So then this is the image that we have where we see the 18 stars, which is a single star. We know where they are. So now we are going to start moving those mirrors, have actuators on the back to put all those stars on top of each other. At the end, you have to end up with a single star. And you can see some of them are not very well focused, you know? Mm -hmm. So you want them all to be focused. You want, so this is a process that took us two months, uh, which ha we had planned up to three, but it took us two months to do this. Um, and if you go to the next slide, so the next slide was the final <laughs> image that some of you might remember. <laughs> which show that we had aligned the mirrors. Those the spikes are because of the diffraction on the mirrors. And this was, again, we were too well focused. I mean, it was like amazing. Everything we were doing we, with this, it was always better than we thought. Uh, so this was definitely an exciting moment for us uh, during, even before the first images were released. And you can see the brightest star there, which is an isolated star, but you can clearly see that there are other objects there. And that's when, even during this period of commissioning, we were realizing how amazing the telescope was, because all those things on the background are galaxies. So we were pointing to a part of the sky that will only have a star, and then we see all these galaxies there. Uh, and I think that's a common theme. I think uh, you cannot look anywhere, even on the <laughs> Neptune, anything you're looking, uh, galaxies, photobomb, James Webb. You're always <laughs> picking them this up on the background. And this is on that image, which was a little bit bigger. We were able to identify all of these galaxies on this image, which was not designed for this. It was just designed to align the mirrors on the single star. So this was even before, you know, we, we were still two months away uh, from releasing, from taking the real science images, and we were already excited in the back, in the control room, seeing <laughs> we, uh, what was there. <laughs> we also had um, constant reminders that we weren't allowed to science our data. No, what we could not. <laughs> All of our engineering data, so this beautiful image, all of these galaxies, we weren't allowed to sit and science them. In They're other words, look at things data. like the shapes of the galaxies and their, their you know, the, the <laughs> detailed how. morphology in them and, and try to figure out, the, you, you weren't allowed to do you any of that. No. Because, because the instruments, it's engineering data. Yeah, the instruments had not been calibrated yet either, right? So I think there was a lot of concern <laughs> of what people will so, come up as a, as so a so discovery. Like there's a fear that you would like, Run see this and it. then like go to a bar and be like, oh my God, like <laughs> I, I know how galaxies work around this one star or something. Yes. Yeah. And so you got yeah. daily warnings. Yeah, wow. so yeah, we weren't allowed to science uh, any of the commissioning data. And, and that even Neptune data even, we weren't allowed, we were not, yeah. I was not allowed to science that data. That's such a funny term. Yeah. I just want to <laughs> underline, like just to make sure everyone really gets what's happening here, because I think this is amazing, is you have this main star and then you see all those like flecks around it and those are just residual galaxies <laughs> hanging out around this star. And, it's, <laughs> and those are all those little flecks that they've now like isolated. It's like a, I don't know, like a memory game or something. And, and just <laughs> for those of you who are not like hardcore astronomers, a galaxy is a collection of billions of stars but it is so far away from us mm -hmm. that it just shows up as a tiny smudge. So every smudge you're seeing there is billions of stars. And right. that's just in this one random field, 
it's near the star they Just picked. this one star. Yeah. Um, I love that you say that the, the galaxy's photobomb, the, <laughs> yeah. that you can't. You can't take a picture of the universe without, without, yeah, without some galaxies just true. getting in the way. <laughs> yeah. um, that's really, really brilliant. I guess we can't ask you any more questions because you'll science it and it's not ready, <laughs> um, which is which is hilarious. Uh, okay, let's see. What do we have? What do we have? Ooh, I like um, any any more on 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 these. Okay. No, we we got a lot to go here. So, <laughs> guys, we have time. Oh, okay. Um, this is, so, so one of the fun things is, um, you know, like, you know, we're sort of breaking down favorites and also thinking about just how the telescope itself was deployed and how it works. And then these are some of the, I mean, they're all sort of results, but this is a, a different thing that came in that, that I think is so cool once Heidi kind of gets into what we're seeing. So you want to tell us? Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm a planetary scientist, but I still love astrophysics too. And when they asked me, what's, what's your favorite image besides Neptune, um, this was the one I picked. And what you're looking at here, you do see some stars. Those are the bright bluish ones with all the spiky things, right? Those are foreground stars. But the, the white blobs in the center, you see those white sort of diffuse blobs? Those are galaxies that are much, much further away. And this is actually a cluster of galaxies. So there's the one bright one in the center, but there's a lot of other white blobs in there. And this cluster of galaxies, remember each galaxy is billions of stars, this cluster is so massive that it is distorting the space time in which it sits. And so if you look around it, you see a whole bunch of little little reddish streaks. Mm -hmm. And if you look at them carefully, you see they kind of form a circle around that. Right. What those reddish streaks are, are even more distant galaxies that have been refocused by this bent space-time. The cluster is acting like what we call a gravitational lens. The gravity of the cluster is creating a lens out of space-time allowing us to see the more distant galaxies being refocused so that we can see them. And so, so amazing. Okay, so when I, when I look at this, am I, are the streaks, like I never, because I, I want to see space-time bent, yeah. right? And so I look at this, and anywhere I see curvature, I'm like, is that it? Is that space-time yeah. bending? And so we're, uh, sorry, also, we're pointing at a screen that we yeah, can yeah. see, but you guys, <laughs> please, look, please look there. Um, but like, so maybe I'll just gesture here. So if you're looking at these big red streaks, mm -hmm. they look kind of curvy. Is, am I seeing a bend? Yes, you are. Absolutely. So that's Einstein. Ein well, in <laughs> fact, Einstein predicted this curvature when you had so much mass in space. And he predicted it really for one star, that if you had another star that was behind it, it would be refocused into a perfect circle if your alignment was right. Okay. It's called an Einstein ring. Okay. Well, here, the cluster isn't a star. It's not a point source. That cluster, there's a lot of galaxies forming the cluster. And so your refocusing isn't a perfect spherical circle. Mm. It's kind of like a weird oblong sort of-y shape and we actually have computer simulations of what the mass must look like. But if you look, you can see the streaks are all more or less kind of oriented. Yeah. Now, there's a lot of other random galaxies in there, too. And those random galaxies are randomly distributed. Are these the, the sparks that are kind of around with yeah. the... Yeah. Ch or the thing, anything that has that, that spiky thing, that's a foreground that's, star. Okay. But oh. if it's a faint, fuzzy... Little oh. elongated thing. <laughs> this is this is, the, this is official NASA speak. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, uh, you know, if you, go online and look at this, and you can zoom into this, and mm -hmm. you'll be able to see all those streaks. Every one of those streaks is a refocused galaxy. In some cases, the same galaxy gets focused more than once. Yeah. And in some cases, the focusing is so good that you can sometimes pick out individual stars or clusters of stars in those galaxies. Right. And so this allows us to not only probe back in time to where this cluster was, but probe even further back in time to those distant galaxies mm. behind it. Hmm. I just, this, it kills me. I'm like, space time, I can see it bending. <laughs> um, Stephanie, this might be the wrong image to, to ask this question to, I'm not sure, but I think about how one of the things you study is ice 
and I do you is is that related to this image? Do you is there is there ice going through your mind when you when you look at this? <laughs> um, not necessarily, but I will say um, one of the things that we're looking for with Webb is the most distant galaxies, for example. Right. And when we first got these images in, um, especially this one, the, the astrophysics community went gaga. And um, they were trying to find which one was the most distant object, which one's the most distant object. And what we're looking for is something called redshift. And okay. redshift is um, a term that's been given to basically trace the age of a galaxy or distance. And what's happening is the universe is constantly expanding, and so galaxies are, are moving away from one another. And when they move away from each other, they're also stretching the light between each other. Mm -hmm. And that includes our own galaxy moving away from others. And so as we're looking further and further um, into the early universe, that light actually takes a considerable amount of time. It's being stretched and distorted from its distance as well as the universe expanding. And so it gets stretched to red wavelengths. Mm. So that's why we have an infrared mm. telescope. <laughs> um, so whenever uh, the scientists started digging into this, this image and they were looking for galaxy far, far away, um, and you know all of uh, Luke Skywalker's family, I'm guessing, <laughs> um, they, they were deceived. Okay. Um, and that deception becomes, comes from color as well. So they were looking for extremely red objects. Oh. While light can be shifted redward if it is more distant, it can also be deceived by becoming red when it's extremely dusty and or icy. So something extremely red doesn't mean that it's very, very far away. It might just mean that it's got a whole lot of dust and gas. And so the only way to confirm if it's galaxy far, far away is through what Heidi was talking about earlier, through the spectrum um, and looking for how far that light has actually traveled and mm. shifted. And so um, they were waiting, the astrophysics community is waiting with bated breath for the spectroscopy to come from this image um, so that they could confirm which objects were extremely far versus those that were just dusty or icy. And if you follow Space News, just in the, like the last 48 hours, there's been a big announcement about the most distant galaxies ever seen. Mm. But it's based on this redness that Stephanie's talking about. So if you read the fine print in the press release, at the end, it says, <laughs> we'll have to wait for the spectroscopy to confirm this. <laughs> so, yeah. That's very cool. Um, so this is... Uh, Begonia, we'll start with you on this one. This is a, a, a almost like an incidental that mm -hmm. JWST was involved in. Do you want to tell us what DART first, maybe DART is? Yes, yeah, so, mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is great. It's a great image yeah. because it involves all of us. Uh, so this was uh, a rocket that's going to be hitting an asteroid. Um, it's a, a part of a different mission to try to uh, in case uh, an asteroid was coming to the Earth, could we deflect it enough so it wouldn't hit uh, the, the Earth? So just to underline, that this was, a, in a sense, a fake mission where uh, we sent uh, something into space yeah, we sent to a space hit an into asteroid space. and knock it off course. Exactly. It was exactly. actually it's just two, happened. I did not know about two, uh, Right. Two, yeah. two of them on orbit yeah. around each other, and it was going to hit one of them mm -hmm. a little bit to deflect its orbit just a little bit, and, okay. and that will show to validate uh, that another super interesting part of space exploration. Um, and this was going to be observed by ground telescopes. It was going to be observed by Hubble the and the collision, okay. just to see when it hit the surface and, and then what happened afterwards. And they also requested, and I think it was thanks to Heidi's time, and that if it could be observed uh, by Webb. Uh, and this uh, brings uh, one of the interesting things. This is, again, a solar system object. So we know from the guiding point of view to be able to track and for them to get the images of the uh, rocket hitting yeah. <laughs> the asteroid, we needed to keep it steady. So we needed to use that moving target, meaning we have to find a star and let it move as fast as the asteroid is going to go. 
Uh, but that was almost wow, four times so faster than anything we had done. Those requirements that he Heidi was saying, they were telling us we, uh, were we can track. We were allowed to track as fast as Mars could go. Right. That was the that was the deal that we made. That we made. And right. like, oh, that's, <laughs> track is that sad? Because they, is that a slow well, amount? That's, it's that's a small, small amount. Because okay. like she said, this was this was three times more than three times faster than that. Than that. The 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 the. Do we send a thing into space? We send a thing into space to hit an asteroid, yeah. or we yeah. following it was a space, an asteroid? Uh, a spacecraft, okay. and then it's going to okay. uh, release it and hit it okay. at a certain. But the asteroid mass. that we were going to hit was the thing that was moving very, yes. very quickly. Right. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And then you. you wanted to take pictures of that uh, spacecraft portion that was going to hit it yeah. as well. Uh, so we had to do a lot of uh, work to make sure the algorithms we had will, will work. We have a very detailed um, simulator that mm -hmm. has taken many years that tries to simulate web as much as possible. So we had to practice there and make some adjustments. And, and, and then I think it worked beautifully. Okay, uh, Stephanie, I don't know if, if you Stephanie, want to yeah. say more. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you're seeing the Hubble Space Telescope version um, and the movie of the Hubble Space Telescope images. So the and, blue is Hubble. And mm -hmm. then the red is the, the JWST image um, just after impact. And we actually observed right before the spacecraft impacted okay. and about five hours afterwards. And so you're seeing a spectacular image showing um, the ejecta of the dust and probably chunks of spacecraft and um, any <laughs> little green men that possibly could have been there, yeah. um, She's just all being video. blown into space. Uh, this was a spectacular demonstration. Um, we were able to track an object moving over three times our requirement. Um, how, can I just ask how fast is that? So we uh, had a speed limit of 30 milli arc seconds per second. So million, no, milli arc. Milli. No, I was like saying, yeah. what was it? Milli arcs? Milli okay. arc yes. seconds. Okay, a word I've so never heard. So okay. 0.03 <laughs> arc seconds okay. per second. And um, that's okay. the fastest speed of Mars. <laughs> okay. And during commissioning, I already knew that I wanted to go faster than that because I study comets, and comets move a heck of a lot faster than okay. Mars. And so um, we pushed the speed limit during commissioning up to 67. So that was fantastic. So we're already breaking the speed limit. And, okay. You know, we're. This is, yeah, humans yeah, just want to go fast. We're I putting like our, it. yeah, our motorcycle goggles on. We're <laughs> really excited. And so when the observations for DART came about, um, now, I'll let Heidi talk a little bit to her program um, just because it's, it's mm -hmm. something that we would have not been able to do unless she let us do, use her time to do this. And so that's, that was a critical component. Um, but this was the first time, so we had, a, we had to figure out how to go really fast. Begonia and her team did all of that beautiful work for us so that we could do this. We got on the schedule one week before observations, before the actual impact event happened. And this was the first time JWST and Hubble observed the exact same thing in the sky at the exact same time. Okay. Not only did they do this, but hundreds of telescopes around the world were also looking at this one event. So this was a spectacular thing for JWST to be a part of and to demonstrate that we could actually support other NASA missions, especially those in planetary science, which is sort of my job. So, mm -hmm. um, so you, yay, did, you did job well. support, <laughs> or job yeah. security, right? Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah. But I'll, I'll let Heidi talk a and little bit about Heidi, that. Heidi, just yeah. to underscore, one of the things everyone keeps talking about is that you have time mm. on the telescope. Yeah. What, does that, what does that mean and how did it get us to this yeah. flyby? So m most time on large uh, professional telescopes is competitively awarded. You write proposals and they are reviewed by your peers and if it is deemed worthy by your peers, then you will get the time to observe it. That's the standard process. But for um, telescopes that are in development, when you sign up in the beginning to say, I'm gonna spend you know, a decade or two decades or two and a half decades of my life to make sure this works, mm -hmm. part of your reward for that is guaranteed time on the telescope. It's so like equity. It, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it's stock. your skin in the game. It's your stock, <laughs> right? Yeah. It, okay. you, you, if you want your data, you mm -hmm. know, you got to make this thing work. Okay. And so uh, each interdisciplinary scientist, and there were six of us, we each got 100 hours of guaranteed time that we could use for whatever we want, as long as we don't break the telescope. 
you know, we can, we can do what we want. In my program, the proposal I had written was to use uh, this telescope to do solar system observations. And so um, this was a solar system observation. Okay. Um, this was uh, emerged uh, well after, you know, we had designed our observing programs. And so, but um, I, I, one, of the, one of the pieces of my guaranteed time was to look at near-Earth asteroids, and this was a near-Earth asteroid, and so they asked if we could repurpose some of the near-Earth asteroid time for the DART mission. And because I'm the only person, you know, who can say yes or no, because it's my time, I, of course, said yes. This is, we have to do this. We have to to do this and testing. And why the quick yes? Because you, there could be a world in which you're like, listen, Hubble's going to see it. There's a whole bunch of telescopes on Earth that are going to look at it. Like, I'm going to use my JWST time for something so what else. So one, one of the principles that Stephanie and I developed about what we wanted to use the guaranteed time for was science, of course, science. Mm -hmm. But we wanted to actually demonstrate to the community what the true capabilities of this telescope mm -hmm. were. How fast can we really go? <laughs> so you heard Stephanie wants yeah. to go faster. <laughs> and so here was an opportunity to truly push the, the capability and to stress begonia, <laughs> make her lose sleep a little bit. How fast can we do? There are other things like we observed Mars because how bright can we really yeah. observe? Here's a telescope designed to look for the faintest objects in the universe. And we want to point at Mars, which is one of the <laughs> brightest objects in the sky. And Jupiter, one of the brightest objects in the sky. And that, again, you know, that stresses. It stresses. I mean, <laughs> Heidi has a very good point. One of the parts we had to do on commissioning was, yes, we designed it to look so far, and now they want to look at these bright <laughs> objects. <laughs> so then that's going to bleed light into the, the instrument, the guiding instrument, right? So instead of having just my nice guide star mm -hmm. in there, I'm going to have all this other light. So we did have a commissioning program where we kept moving uh, Jupiter closer and closer to see how close can, can it be to the guiding instrument and still, still perform. And some of those images are the engineering images that were afterwards yeah. released. So lots of coordination to make yeah. sure everybody's yeah. happy. Some <laughs> of the other programs that, that we alluded to earlier tonight that we can't talk about yet are mm -hmm. also programs that were Risky, risky, not in the sense that they would stress begonia and cause trouble for the telescope, but risky in that they may not yield the science return. Mm. And so um, if you put them forward through a traditional process, they would probably get turned down mm -hmm. because they're not guaranteed mm -hmm. to give results. Mm -hmm. And so those, again, were the kind of programs that I was putting in my guaranteed time because nobody could tell me no. I mean, it's guaranteed. Mm -hmm. It's me. <laughs> I can say. Also, you, know, <laughs> you said you were one of six. Yeah. Can I? One of six in an entire universe of scientists that gets <laughs> to say, like, what we're going to point this telescope at. Yeah. My, my, I that. was the one. There was also another fellow who had a few solar system things in. He was more interested in exoplanets, but my program was just solar system. There was also an interdisciplinary scientist who was interested in the most distant galaxies. There was another who was interested in star formation. There was another who was interested in how galaxies evolve over space and time. So, you know, we, we covered yeah. sort of the full range of the science that could be done. Okay. Um, I'm going to do some audience questions. This is, this is so good, so we're just going to keep going, but just, but just to say that QR code, and I'll get back to it, but yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, let's see, these are fun. Um, okay, Anonymous, Stephanie, I'm gonna ask you this. Anonymous <laughs> asked, what fraction of the whole nebula does the first mountainous photo you showed represent? Oh, I don't know if I know an actual person. I would say less than 1%. That's yeah. it. This is, it. Maybe we should do a speed <laughs> round. Um, uh, Begonia, I'm just like picking people with these, mm -hmm. but feel free to jump in. We have, or any of, this is a good one for anyone. We have a four month old daughter at home. This is from Marguerite. We have a four month old daughter at home. What's your advice to her future self for how to nav navigate a male dominant world in career and life? Um, okay, that's a super cool question. Um, I think 
and there are many things, but I will say to encourage her to follow what she likes, right? Uh, choose what she likes and then uh, develop that to to the <laughs> to as far as she can, yeah. and then uh, be behind her. I think the uh, having parents and other support system is very important. Mm -hmm. um, I will tell her when I look back, I wish I was more uh, secure of myself when I was mm -hmm. younger because it truly is is much better now. I will say now that it's about a 25 percent maybe of uh, females on our fields. It was much less when I started. And it's easy to wow, say now that and much less. That's still yeah, yeah, not it was a lot. Yeah, and and you have to be comfortable, uh, confident on yourself, right? That you can do it. But that's easier afterwards than when you are younger, right? You have lots of challenges. So yes, and not to give up, uh, continue. And then I think your your parents and others, teachers, can do a lot to mm -hmm. uh, encourage you to keep going. Mm. Um, I don't know if you guys have other other advice. You know, it is yeah. still a, a male world, but when people <laughs> tell you no, ignore them. <laughs> you say we're going to point at the brightest object. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, it's true. For for, for there's yeah. a, lot, a lot of times. I mean, I sort of similar age of Gonya. I've encountered people saying things like. Oh, I didn't know women did astronomy. I'm like, yes, we do. Mm -hmm. you know, and people, you look just like an ordinary mom. I'm like, that's because I am an ordinary mom who happens to be a scientist. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when, you know, there have been plenty of times in my career when uh, people have just said, no, you can't do that. And I just say, well, guess what? I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, can't, you can't get into MIT. Well, I'm going to apply to MIT. And when they say, well, you only got into MIT because you're a woman, and I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to graduate from MIT, <laughs> you know. And, and you just, you just kind of, you just have to keep going. Yeah. I don't, it's hard to tell how do you build resilience into young people. Mm, you just encourage the them question. to keep going. Yeah. yeah. Just yeah. encourage them. That's coming back to the parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Stephanie, I'm going to ask you, from, I think Raphael, or Raphael, not sure. Do the stars have six major points of light because the mirrors are hexagonal? Yes, so it's the diffraction oh. pattern of our, so we have hexagonal individual segments which make a giant hexagon, um, and so that gives you the primary diffraction spikes. Um, but then we also have um, the secondary mirror, it's held on um, three struts, so it's suspended in front of the mirror. Um, and where those struts actually um, cross over some of the segments, we get another diffraction. And it's a tiny sort of horizontal line that, that you see across the center of the And I will say, we had modeled all of that, and Begonia and her team were probably part of this. We knew what those point spread functions would look like. And when we actually got, when they got to the point where they were aligned, and they just looked exactly like the models. Yes. So we were working we, we right had, at the edge of We physics. had games, not games, but in the control room where uh, the, the optical team, the, wave, the, the mirror team will have a modeled image and the other image, and they will try to tell us uh, which one do you think is the real one. They, they were that good. Yeah. And sometimes we will get it wrong because they put too many noise, too many back <laughs> pixels, too many whatever, and the, the image itself was better. So it was a huge effort. Um, maybe it's a good thing to mention that uh, we said this telescope operates that cold. Obviously, we cannot build it at minus 387 degrees. We have to build it at normal temperatures. And you know when you put materials in your freezer, they are going to change, they are going to move. So you need this very um, detailed modeling to build something and these ambient temperatures where we live to model how it's going to change once it's that cold and that everything is going to point as mm. you need it to point. So as Heidi says, lots of So if we had those. a different telescope, we might be seeing stars on these images that have 12 points. Right, or they wouldn't oh. be focused, or, or if the throughput wasn't so good, they would be dimmer, we wouldn't be able to see that far. So there were lots of things at play that could have made it but that's not why, perfect. Yeah, you're, that sh what she's saying is exactly right. If we have, uh, that's why if you look at um, images from other telescopes, their, their diffraction spikes, the little spikes of the stars, they look different from different telescopes because they depend on the design of the telescope. So they won't, they won't look like ours. Did we, did we carefully like want 
six peaks or six points, or is that just like what the technology, what made sense? It's physics yeah. made yeah. it that the, way. The, the hexagon was the best shape. I, I, I guess we know the beast have always been very clever, and that's the best <laughs> shape to connect individual mirrors. So you will be able, if you look at it now, you okay. wouldn't know it's made of a smaller mirrors, right? It's a single uh -huh. one. So it's that's a, the best shape to connect them all. And um, Jeremiah asks, how does Webb dodge space debris like asteroids, comets, or smaller objects? Well, we can't. <laughs> it can't. So, it can't. No. It's sitting out there it's totally sitting out there. <laughs> exactly. And that, and that was one of the things as well. Lots of other telescopes you might see have wow. baffles, right, to try to protect it. But the design on Webb was open, uh, so there was a lot of analysis done to see based on the environment there. Uh, how many hits will we get, what could be done, aligning those mirrors to recover from some of them. And you do an analysis to know how things will get worse over time, but over five years, over 10 years, over 20 years, how bad can it get to still get the science and you backtrack it and try to, to build it. But yes, we can. I think some people might have heard about asteroid hits or there micro is maybe micro, a micrometeorite, micrometeorite, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> micrometeorites, <laughs> yes, <laughs> micrometeorites, and there might be, for some of them, we can point slightly in a different yeah, direction. Yeah, so, so we're, yeah. we're trying not to now um, aim the telescope at, you know, um, debris trails that we happen to be going through, so we know that um, mm -hmm. comets especially comets that come around the sun frequently, they leave their, you know, their snail trail behind them. Um, and that's what creates beautiful meteor showers um, mm. in our Earth's atmosphere is when the Earth passes through these cometary snail trails. And um, so JWST is going around the Earth, or going around the sun with the Earth, so it's going through the same trails um, periodically. It's actually going through them. Yeah, we actually mm -hmm. go through them. Mm -hmm. um, and. So what we're doing now um, for future op operations with the JWST is when we're going through one of those, we're just not aiming the telescope at them. <laughs> so like, we, because like the most vulnerable parts would be getting Yeah, we'd just be getting crumbs. hit by, yeah. by more debris. Mm -hmm. So we're just trying to point the telescope kind mm -hmm. of in the opposite direction whenever we're going through one of those debris trails. Yeah. So it's, mm -hmm. um, and they do happen. I mean, we have meteor showers, what, about a dozen times a year. So we go through, we go through comet trails all the time. <laughs> but like Begonia said, we've designed the telescope so that even after it's been bombarded with micrometeorites, it still is performing at the level we need to do the science. That was all part of the design of the mm. telescope. The one reason we are talking about these micrometeoroids a lot is because a few months into the mission, there was a, one particularly large one mm -hmm. that hit. Um, it, was, it was noticeable in, yes. in, the, in the shape of the mirror. It had slightly deformed the shape of the mirror. And um, oh. It was thought to be, um, people started to get really worried. Oh, gosh, were our models wrong about the, the distribution of small, medium, and large hits? Um, and uh, so there was a lot of more thinking. I'm sure you were part of that. Um, we have since been hit by at least 14, uh, I think, I think yeah, something like that. Yeah, I think it's like about that. once a month. Yeah, there's always, average. but they all yeah. have been little ones except that one. My gosh, and you guys so, are so relaxed. Well, you know, <laughs> making them, makes it's, me nervous. it's statistics, right? <laughs> Just because we knew that there would be one over the lifetime of the mission. That was part of the model. The fact that really? it happened in like the first couple of months is what <laughs> sent everybody into a tizzy, but Statistics <laughs> works that way. That's, what I was That's how it works, yeah. you know? And it does, just because you got hit once, that doesn't mean that you're gonna get hit more and more and more. That could have been our one, and it could have just happened at that time. Yeah. So, so we are paying close attention, and there haven't been in any more of the, the uh, there has not been another one of that magnitude right. since then. Um, so we are near to wrapping, so I just want to put it on, um, yeah, this final image, which I chose, but actually along with members of this team as my favorite. Um, I mean, I have not seen as many images as, as y'all, but, but this one to me when it came out just blew me away. It really reminds me of like, um, almost like a Greek myth of like the gods, like the, the pillars of the Greek gods, um, sort of a Zeusian like up in the, the heavens as you would call them, um, 
yeah, just looking over creation and making stuff from it. And it really blows me away every time I see it. And yeah, and it felt like ending on like such a powerful, powerful image where we come back from now you know in a way like how this image was made, where the colors come from, what some of those shiny objects are, what all that dust is. Um, but it also just still has this like most epic, how, what is that, you know? How does that exist out there? And we actually get to see it. Um, and just, just a quick please. aside. So the, the image on the left is from the Hubble Space Telescope. Yes. And the image on the right is from the James Webb Space Telescope. And this is actually the near-infrared version of the James Webb Space Telescope version of this image. You can go online and look up the mid-infrared mm -hmm. one, which we <laughs> released um, just before Halloween, and it <laughs> looks um, pretty terrifying. Really? Yeah. It but, is. Um, they're, yeah. they're fantastic. So mm -hmm. uh, it's I like just an organ in a great church. You know, those really tall and. <laughs> do -do -do -do. I'm like, what is coming out of that? But you know, yeah. this actually is bringing us full circle to where we started, mm. because what you're seeing in this image is very similar to what you saw in the cosmic eclipse you have up above, way above what you can't see, a collection of extremely bright stars that are blasting their stellar wind down into this nebula. And what those pillars are, at the tips of those pillars is where stars are being born. And that's where there's high density clumps. And so at the tips of every one of these, if you look carefully, you see how they seem to be glowing more at the tips. That's some of the starlight from those newborn stars wow. peeking out, especially in the web image. And yeah. so these are these. This is star birth happening right in front of your eyes. And with web, the longer wavelengths allow us to see through the dust. Uh -huh. And so you see the Hubble image is murkier. There's a lot of dust, but with the longer wavelengths of web, we can probe through the dust and just get right in there to where the stars are being born. So uh, it's, just, it's just where we started. It's mm -hmm. cosmic cliffs, but on a more detailed scale. Right. Uh, please join me in thanking Heidi, Stephanie, and Begonia for, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, there is a party. James is going to tell you about it. So don't. I don't know where James, James. Everyone's like, if the, the, we're waiting with bated breath. There's a party. There's a reception. I think we will be there. <laughs> so you should come too. Let's have another hand for our incredible panel. I cannot thank you enough for such an inspiring evening of conversation. It was truly the best way to wrap our current season. So thank you. Thank you again to Jack and Susie Reno for making programming like this possible at the museum. We could not do this without you. Thank you for all of you for spending your Monday night with us. Uh, we're going to say goodnight to our friends who are watching on the live stream. Thank you.